after receiving from you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Craig. It's so good to be back with you. When was it that we were back is here the first time? Was it a year ago, a year and a half? Two years ago. Boy, time goes by when you're having fun, eh? Just year and a half? Laptops are heavy. <laughs> the more time goes by, the closer you have to have things. You know? <laughs> but my hearing is better than last time. Yeah, thanks to a little hearing aid center down, down by the bridge here. Is it Hemerick or Hemerich? Hearing center? Yeah, my wife and daughter finally kept, you know, persisting. Jerry, I think you need to get your ears checked out, right? So I said, what? No, <laughs> no just. That's. <laughs> my dear wife, Pam, is with us today. And uh, tonight, I'll, when I come back, uh, there's a team coming from our church, Jubilee Christian Fellowship in Stratford. Uh, Hoping to have uh, one or two prophetic teams as well as a general prayer ministry team. So, uh, hope we'll have lots of fun tonight doing some ministry with you. Um, who's on? Uh, it's not okay. Barry's the, over there. If you're Barry, okay. Hi, Barry. Good to see you again. Uh, if you could show that first video clip, it's Smartest Dog. So, trust you enjoy this. <laughs> yeah, that's the PowerPoint. So there's a video, there's one video clip I'd like to show now, and then probably one at the end. So, smartest dog. There we go. You think you? All right, Jumpy. Everybody's been asking us if you could do skid boots routine. You think you can do it? So. Stay. Back up. Back up. Back. Back. Back up. Sit. Down. Stay. Crawl. Stay. Back. Slow. 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 Stay. Slow. Stay. Turn around. Turn the other way. Ready? Back up. Back. Back. Back up. Back up. Look at it. Back up. Back. Ready? Slow. One step. One more step. Don't you look at it. Back up. Back up. Back up. Back up. Back up. Get close. Wait. Sit. Take a sneak peek. Get close. Wait. Back up. Get close. Back up. Get close. Back up. Get close. Stay. You can touch it if you want, but you cannot get it. All right, you might start counting. Stay. I'm going to count to three. Only when I say three, you can get it. You understand? Here we go. One. Two. Two and a half. Four, 50, 80. All right, let's go back. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Go for Good for Glad you enjoyed that. <laughs> I love this uh, video clip for a number of reasons. Uh, 
Not only does it just show the instant obedience to the voice of the master of this dog, but uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the dog's tail would be wagging at times. And of course, at the end, was greatly rewarded with the fun of playing with his toy and uh, with his tail wagging away. And, I, and it just reminds me of that's how we should be with our master, the Lord Jesus, where we're saying, and we sang that song, take my life and let it be, my heart, my mind, my intellect, uh, every part of me. Lord, I just offer it to you and, and uh, in trusting obedience uh, and with joy. And so just like that dog was just... Uh, loves to hear his master's voice and promptly uh, obey, knowing that he will be rewarded. Uh, that is the same with us, that we are to have this amazing, loving relationship with the Lord. And as he whispers to us and speaks through his word and uh, in other creative ways, uh, that as we respond to him out of joy and childlike trust, uh, there's much joy for him and for us in the process. And... Uh, so as we look at this topic that Pastor Craig has asked me to come and share this for these next two days on fivefold ministry, uh, that's our starting point. We say, Lord, teach us. We want to hear your voice. We want to follow you, even if it stretches us and uh, at times challenges us. And uh, so I, I just sense that's your heart, and I think we're going to have some fun together. So uh, yes, you okay with that? Okay, if we got that PowerPoint, Barry. And I'm going to bring it up as well for my sake, so I don't have to keep turning around. So our heart is to obey the Lord, right? But at, at times, our perception may not be quite accurate. You know, if I got, I, I need a hearing aid so I can hear better. I need glasses to see better. And there's things that the Lord will say, okay, you just need to make an uh, adjustment here so that you see better so you can obey me more fully. And there's much joy all around. Well, it's interesting to look at North and South America sideways. I don't know if anybody's ever done that before. You realize that the Americas sideways look like a duck. Well, that's a fresh new angle on it, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I got this remote. Okay. Let's see if it'll work. Here we go. Now, how about you? When I grew up going to school, this is probably pretty much the standard map that we're used to seeing. I think it was created in the 1500s. Hmm. I believe they also, it was created by, uh, the, the map maker was from Europe. Anybody notice Europe is a dead, you know, in the center of this map? <laughs> if you go to Japan, I think there's world maps that you would have in Japan where Japan's at the center of the map. We're all very ecocentric. <laughs> uh, I believe this was created by a German uh, map maker. So its center point is Europe. The problem with that is it puts, even though it's the maps of the nations are pretty well accurate in their shapes, the fact that Europe is in the center when it's much higher than the equator, further north, it causes the northern hemisphere to be stretched and actually be out of proportion size-wise, not shape-wise, but size-wise. Does Greenland look about the same size as the continent of South America in that map? And so that's how I grew up believing, wow, Greenland's about the size of South America. Only to find out later, in reality, Greenland, you could put almost nine Greenlands into the continent of South America. My wife's been to Greenland. And uh, it is a big hunk of land but nothing compared to, uh, to that. Think of shrinking that down and putting nine Greenlands into South America. So that just shows how things that we've assumed growing up, this is the way it is, sometimes ain't the way it is. And uh, we're going to be looking at that as we look at the topic of the fivefold ministry. This morning, obviously, I'll just be scratching the surface. We'll get into it a little deeper tonight and then tomorrow night. Okay, trying to keep up with you here. 
Jesus declared, and this is nothing new to you, Matthew 16. Jesus declared, I will build my church. What's the rest of that sentence? And the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail. So Jesus is having a conversation with Peter and his other disciples. And Peter had just made a confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responded and said, Amen, brother. (laughs) And said, upon this confession of who I am, I will build my church. But Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, for those of us in church leadership, that takes an enormous hunk of pressure off us, you know, what some people call false responsibility. Because we feel like we're responsible to build the church. When Jesus said, no, no, first of all, it's my church, not yours, and I will build it. It's his job. Our job, according to the New Testament, is first of all the great commandment. We're to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, and love others around us as ourselves. The great commandment, that's our first job. Another job the Lord gave us as his disciples is found in Matthew 28, the great commission. So there's the great commandment and the great commission to make disciples of all nations or all people groups. So there's two important jobs that we've been assigned, but Jesus' job is to build the church. Now, we could go expand this a little further and talk about several times in the New Testament we're told to seek first the kingdom of God and to pursue spiritual gifts. There's a number of things we're to seek and pursue according to the New Testament, but our job is to love God, love each other, and make disciples, whatever that all means. There's a lot to that. So in order for Jesus to build his church, uh, let's try that again. There we go. In order for Jesus to build his church and for us to love him and others and make disciples, the Lord gave us his Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus said in is it John 13 or John 16, he said to his disciples, hey guys, pretty soon I will be going away. But it'll be to your advantage that I go away because in my going, the Father and I will be able to send you the third person of the Trinity, the Comforter, the Counselor, who's just like Jesus. So he sent his Holy Spirit, and that happened Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. But he's also given us the Scriptures, the Word of God, and various gifts. And uh, there's three lists, famous lists in the New Testament about spiritual gifts that the Lord gives his people in order that his church will be built and his kingdom will expand. So in 1 Corinthians 12, we have the, some call them the spiritual gifts, some call them controversial gifts. And, uh, and then in Ephesians 4, which is what we're looking at today and tomorrow, uh, the service gifts of the fivefold ministry. And then in Romans 12, there's a list of working gifts. It's interesting. Corinthians 12, it says there are gifts given by the Holy Spirit. The gifts in Ephesians are given by the ascended Christ. And then the list of gifts in Romans 12, are given by the Father. Interesting, eh? All three persons of the Trinity are intricately involved in giving us gifts. Gifts that we don't deserve, we don't have to earn or work for. That's the whole thing about grace. C.S. Lewis once went to a World Religions conference uh, where all these leaders of different religions were going there and were there, and he was late coming back from the lunch and the afternoon session had already begun. He came in a few minutes late, and there was all this hustle and bustle and heated discussion going on. And C.S. Lewis said to the, to the guys, excuse me, but uh, what are we discussing here? And, and, and they said, well, we're trying to distinguish, is there anything unique about Christianity over all the other world religions? C.S. Lewis just responded, oh, that's easy. Grace. Grace. Say grace. Grace. Yes. Man has a tendency to turn turn things back into a works righteousness, trying to earn brownie points with God. And even as Christians, there's that tendency. We know, okay, we're saved by grace, but now we think we've got to now work to uh, somehow keep him happy or, you know, please the Lord. 
there are works in Ephesians, Paul talks about, hey, we're saved by grace so that no one can boast. But then he goes on to say, but we are God's workmanship. The Greek word there is where we get our word poem, where we are God's creative masterpiece, saved in order to do good works, but we're not saved by good works. Big difference, right? So this is all about grace. And even the word gift is, it's the outcome of grace. It's given to you freely. Now, it costs Jesus a lot our salva- for it to bring our salvation and these gifts in terms of his death on the cross and his uh, laying down his life and then rising again from the dead. But uh, it's all about grace. But today, again, we'll be looking just at that Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 11, the five gifts that the ascended Christ gave his church as he's building his church. The gift of apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, evangelist. Now, I'm sure this is not new to you, but I'm trusting that there might be some fresh insights that the Lord will, little nuggets that will drop into your spirit that will just enlarge uh, your vision of what God is up to and uh, stir your faith that, hey, I get to be part of what God is up to in these days. Because, folks, we are stepping into the most exciting days, years, I believe, in all of church history. Before the return of Jesus, God is going to uh, show off, and he's going to accelerate the expansion of his kingdom on the planet massively. And to do that, and we sang a song about restoration. The church is in a process of restoration and renewal, yes? Even within our lifetime, we've seen how God is progressing and developing the church, renewing and restoring. Why don't we read the scripture together? Maybe I'll sit down because I'm probably blocking the screen on some of you. Let's say this together. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. I don't know if you've thought of it this way, but uh, these five gifts that Jesus has given the church are actually expressions of Jesus. Each gift is a facet or an aspect of Christ's character, nature, and who he is. I think that's kind of cool. We find in scripture that Jesus is the apostle, he is the prophet, he is the evangelist, he is the great shepherd, the good shepherd, And Jesus is the the teacher. All five of these, he operated in, you know, par excellence. Uh, And he gives these gifts or facets of himself to the church so that we can truly represent him to the world. Does that make sense? That may not be uh, profound, but uh, it's just good to remember that. I... I meant to give you each, each scripture that actually makes reference. In Hebrews, it talks about Jesus, the, the apostle and priest. Uh, I, I could give you the scriptures, but I don't have them in front of me. So can you trust me on that one? There is. <laughs> so these five gifts are then to flow down to the whole body of Christ and impact us all. Now, maybe you've uh, heard this before, and I believe your pastor has taught on fivefold ministry. Maybe he's given this. You've given this before? No? Okay. I found this very helpful uh, visual, and that a stick of your hand, the thumb is the apostle, the index finger is the prophet, the middle finger, the evangelist, the pastor, the ring finger, and the baby finger is the teacher. The apostle, he touches all four other fingers. He's the stabilizing counterpoint. 
the index finger, the prophet, he points, gives direction to the church. He may point at you and call forth your destiny. Middle finger is your longest finger for most of us. Right? Should be your longest finger. The evangelist, he reaches out, touches the world. The ring finger, the pastor, he's married to the bride, to the church. Focusing on developing loving relationships, community. And, uh, and then the baby finger being the teacher that can wiggle right into your ear. Kind of worm in there and uh, bring precision and, and detail to the truth of the word of God. So Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, Christ gave those five gifts for the purpose of equipping of the saints for the work of service or ministry to the building up of the body of Christ until, verse 13, we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and thirdly, to maturity, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Interesting. Now, uh, look at that middle section. The purpose of the five leadership gifts for the equipping of the saints. Unfortunately, in history, older Bible translations over the centuries have put a fatal comma where they shouldn't have. And it comes out of ecclesiastical bias within church history of institutionalism. So when it says, here's the five gifts, they're given for the equipping of the saints, comma, where there shouldn't be a comma. This translation obviously took it out, and that's correct, theologically correct. But if you put a comma at the end of equipping the saints, you're now seeing that the five offices have three purposes. For the equipping of the saints, that's one purpose. Those leaders for their work of ministry, and then thirdly, for the building up of the body of Christ. But that first comma should never have been there, and now New Testament scholars in recent decades and any modern translations have taken that comma out. First of all, in Greek, you don't have punctuation. So it's, a, it's, it's the translation committee's call on whether, whether they put a period or a comma. And unfortunately, the bias over the centuries has been to put a comma there, which in other words said that these five different types of leaders are to equip the saints but then the five leaders do all the ministry, the work of ministry, when in fact their job is to equip the saints for the saints to do the work of ministry. You may say, well, that's just a small point. Now, that's massive. Like that does a major paradigm shift for the church, and we're still making that, and it, it takes decades, if not centuries, to correct that theological bias that has that has uh, caused the church not to fully function as God designed it to. Question is, how long do we need all five equipping gifts? Well, again, Ephesians 4.13 tells us how long do we need all five until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Anybody know any church in history, let alone in the present, that has fully come into that? So until we do, we need all five equipping gifts or offices. Would you agree? But that's the other historical bias we're fighting. Not only that fatal comma that made it so that the thought was, hey, leaders do ministry. You call the pastor church leaders, you call them ministers, and you call the people laity. Now, the Greek word laos means the people of God, and that's a good biblical word, but the Greek word laity means uneducated people. So, in the first century, the New Testament church, the early church, functioned with all five of those gifts, and every follower of Jesus was considered a minister of the gospel and a minister of reconciliation. And we were an interactive family and an army equipped by the five equipping leader uh, aspects of Jesus and fully functioning. But over time, the enemy knew how to just come in there with institutionalization and uh, start to 
drag things down. So by the time we get into the third, fourth century, things are getting, well, we, we go into what's called the Dark Ages. A thousand years or 900 years of the Dark Ages be prior to the Reformation in the 1500s. So by the third and fourth century, five-fold equipping team and every member ministry had vanished. <coughs> Unbiblical clergy versus laity distinction was emphasized. And each church left was left with a single pastor or a bishop. And of course, the cartoon here, the clearly unscriptural role of the super pastor and the harm it causes to the body of Christ. So, so what's ended up happening historically is that rather than having all five gifts of leadership to equip the saints operative, we're really down to one, two, or three over the last 15, 1,800 years. So this is a major, you know, how many know it takes, you know, you can have a little speedboat and you can turn. The agility is pretty Im impressive, but you get a big ocean liner or one of those big cruise ships, and they, if you turn the, the helm, the steering wheel, uh, it's probably going to take a number of miles before that, you know, the, the rudder can turn, but it takes quite a few miles to get that big ship to actually start turning. And so as God is renewing and restoring his church, it takes a long time for for those actual changes to, to take place. And uh, so we've been, for most of the centuries, at best, operating out of three out of the five, the pastor, teacher, and evangelist. Why don't you go like this? Just put up the three like that. Can you imagine trying to carry things or trying to work on the typewriter or I'm on your laptop? Why don't you shake somebody's hand next to you with, with just three fingers? <laughs> It's a little awkward. <laughs> but the church has been functioning on, at best, three out of five cylinders. If I can use the analogy of a car with a motor with only five cylinders, three out of five. How many would say we're just not fully functioning yet? Hmm. And even if you do have all five gifts around, often they've been chased out of the church. So you see on the bottom left, the prophets, well, they left the church because there's not really a place for them. Evangelists, well, they're busy doing crusades. And when they get people saved, the stats I've heard that only about 5% of those that get converted at major crusades, only 5% get discipled and integrated into a church family. You see, there's a disconnect as the evangelists do their work And as the prophets are kind of cut off and doing their own thing, and apostles, well, they're probably out starting new pioneering works and parachurch ministries. That are s Even the word parachurch ministry means beside the church, but not really integrated with the church. And so we get this segregation going on. Teachers in the body of Christ, well, they tend to gravitate uh, to universities, Bible colleges, and seminaries. And there's a need for them there, but we also need them in the church. And uh, so if it just leaves the poor pastor trying to lead and trying to, to fulfill all that God has called the fivefold to do, well, obviously, he's going to burn out. Uh, I, I need to check the stats on, on burnout among pastors. It's something like, I don't know, if you, it's been a few years since I saw the study. It was something like about 70% of pastors are depressed, <laughs> would just love to do some other line of work, and just, you know, maybe 50, 60% don't finish well. They either retire early or find other work uh, before, you know, retirement because they just get frustrated and burned out because there's this one-man band that God never designed for them. They weren't wired to do it all. And, and yet our tradition and our mindset pushes anyone who feels called to pastor uh, into uh, expectations that are unrealistic to me. And... Uh, We pastored, actually, Jubilee Christian Fellowship in Stratford in the 1990s. We came 1990. I was assistant pastor with John Arnott for, for a couple of years. Then he moved to Toronto. I became the senior pastor at Jubilee. But by uh, end of 1998, I had burned out. My wife had been going through uh, clinical depression. Uh, we hit some dark days. Resigned the church, and the Lord opened up a, a re Christian retreat center near Collingwood for us 
to run for a few years that was stress-free. And, uh, and then eventually we went back to Barrie, our hometown. And I had pastored uh, there for 10 years. And then we came back to Stratford three years ago, not to pastor again. I was actually writing books and enjoying a break from all the pressures of pastoring. And uh, we came back because our daughter was fighting a, a health crisis while she was pregnant with our first grandchild. So we came to support her. And uh, after I finished writing my second book, the church asked me to pastor again. So I've been pastoring at Jubilee for the last two years. Um, but we're seeking to develop a five-fold leadership team. So that takes a lot of pressure off, you know, so it's not a solo pastor model. And I uh, hmm, wasn't planning on sharing that, but there's a little bit of personal touch that maybe I'll touch on again later in another meeting. So if we've only really operating out of pastor, teacher, and evangelist, and the evangelist really doing separate from the church, and many teachers are separate from the church at different teaching institutions, you're left with just the pastor. But if you do have the three of them uh, in a church setting, you're still missing the apostle and the prophet. And with that, the, the apostle and the prophet are very much wired to look and, and, and track vertically with heaven. So many churches are powerless, not flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit or uh, having really heaven kissing earth and the glory of God coming, often because we don't have the apostolic prophetic components within the church. And so the church is missing out on a lot of what the Bible offers us, but we're not living in, we're impoverished. And so many, over the centuries, many theologians developed theologies to excuse us from our impoverished state, to give it to rationalize why we're so impoverished. Some would have the theology called cessationism. And that is, well, the gifts of the Holy Spirit ended after the first century when all the original apostles died. And now that we have the Bible, we don't need gifts of prophecy or healings or words of knowledge and miracles. And, and, and we don't need apostles and prophets. Have you heard that? I grew up with that. That all these supernatural gifts, well, they died off a long time ago. Don't look for them. Don't seek them. Don't expect them. And so I've been on this journey, and I bet you many of you have as well, journey of, hey, I think there's more for us than what we've grown up and been taught theologically. So there's the theology of cessationism, and there's the theology of there's no such thing as apostles and pastors anymore. How many, true confessions, how many have been raised that that was being told that was the case, that apostles and prophets had died out and we don't need them anymore, we don't have them anymore? Or am I the only one that grew up that way? Okay, there's two of us. So I'll be preaching to <laughs> over here. How many have heard of Bill Johnson from Redding, California, Bethel Church there? Uh, okay, a good number of you. Bill Johnson, I don't, sorry, I don't have a picture of him. But uh, he is an apostolic leader who's developed a, a leadership team around him and in his church of all fivefold. And I would say it's one of the most mature and fruitful fivefold ministry teams that I've seen in the world. Now, I'm sure there's many others, but it's one of them that's most inspired me, and they're seeing incredible fruit for, out of that. Uh, there's other apostolic centers with fivefold operating. There's the International House of Prayer, Mike Bickle in Kansas City. There's Rick Joyner and Morning Star Ministry, South Carolina. I believe Toronto Airport Catch the Fire is is got a, a growing and a maturing five-fold model as well. They may not talk about it a lot, but in reality, they are stepping into that more and more. You may be aware of some others that maybe you're inspired by, but uh, God is birthing something, folks, that it won't just be in the big cities. I believe God is going to cause this in the next move of God that I believe is just around the corner that we are going to see tens of thousands of apostolic leaders, prophetic leaders, and pastors, evangelists, and teachers rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit, catching the vision of what God is doing in these last days. And uh, so I'm obviously very excited. So what we've had historically 
is this problem. That the church has became more like a spectator sport. So there's the laity, the uneducated people in the stands, and you got the, the few elite down playing the game. So you got 22 players down there desperately in need of rest, 50,000 people desper- desperately in need of exercise. <laughs> and God, in building his church, did not have this as the blueprint. But unfortunately, that's what's happened, partly because of that flawed comma. That was really because of the theology behind it. That there's clergy, the, the professionals who put on the show, and then the uneducated people who come and just warm up a pew and throw some change in the, in the offering basket, you know, what some people call nickels and noses. When we're really called to be an interactive family, and an army that's mobilized and dangerous. <laughs> so let's look at the larger words there. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's what the fivefold are do. They're, they're not an end in themselves. Uh, in this time where there's been a, a, an emphasis of the fivefold, I've seen it in America particularly, that it's almost like the devil pushes you. Like if you're in one ditch over here and you're trying to the pendulum starting to swing over to restore some truths, the enemy will actually try to push you too far, way over here. And so now you have some super apostles in the church saying, I I am an apostle. Call me Apostle George. Um, Hey, tithe to your church 10% and tithe 10% to me as your apostle. Like some of this abuse and nonsense is actually starting to happen, which could then turn some people off to want to go back to the other ditch. We're to, we're to avoid the two ditches and track down the, the highway of holiness, the path of life that's life-giving, that the Lord call, is calling us to. So those five-fold equipping gifts are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It's interesting. I, I, just, I guess I'm a teacher, and I love to dig a little deeper with a microscope. And that, the Greek word for equip, you can see it up top, it's, but this word is found um, in history back at that time is used in surgery for setting a broken limb or putting a joint back into place. It's used in the New Testament for mending fishing nets. So when James and John and those guys were out in their boat and they had their nets rip, it says that uh, in Matthew 4.21 and Mark 1.19 that they mended their nets. It's this Greek word to equip. So the basic idea of to equip is to put something into the condition in which it ought to be in order to function as it was designed to function. So the five leadership equipping gifts are to help each member in the body of Christ to find, to, to help, uh, you know, if there's something broken, help put it, you know, mend it and, uh, and, and straighten it out so that it can be functioning as God designed it to function. Interesting, equip the saints. I don't know how often you think of yourself as a saint. Again, the Greek word for saint, it's really the, means the holy ones. And that's what the followers of Jesus are called in Scripture. We find the Apostle Paul talking often at the beginning of his letters. He says, to the saints of Ephesus, or Rome, or Corinth, or Philippi. He refers to every member, every Christian, as a saint. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and greet them by calling them Saint, whatever their first name is. Saint Pam, (laughs) Saint Craig. (laughs) Now, do you receive that? Or do you kind of repel that and go, oh, that's... Yeah, because historically we know in the, the Roman Catholic Church, they canonize certain Christians who've done, you know, minimum three documented miracles, and they've done accomplished many great things for the kingdom of God. Then they may canonize them years later and say they are a saint. When biblically, we're all called saints. You don't have to earn it. We have been qualified just by the fact that you gave your life to Jesus. You asked him to forgive you of your sin, and you were born again of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. 
And you made a great exchange when you made a covenant with God through what Christ accomplished on the cross. It was a great exchange. You gave him your filthy rags, and he gave you the white robes of Christ, of righteousness. And he sees you as holy, positionally. Now, of course, we know that there's tension in two different truths here. We are holy, but we're also, we are becoming holier in experientially. Yes, sanctification is a process and a position. We are seen by the Lord as holy ones, so he calls us saints. And then, as we see ourselves for who we are because of Christ in us, he's calling us to step into that in, in a full, mature uh, way and reality. Equipping the saints. You are a minister, because it says those five-fold leadership gifts are to equip, mend you, make you so that you're healed up and you're mended and wired in such a way that you're functioning the way God designed you to function, which brings fulfillment to you and fruitfulness for the kingdom. How many want to make a difference in this world before you take your last breath? Yeah, I think we can all say, yes, we want to make a difference. Well, now Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the Lord says, I've got an assignment for you. If he doesn't, he might as well just take you home now. Right? And he says, we are to be equipped, us as saints, to be equipped for the work of ministry. Now, let's get one thing straight, because I want to make this very clear. We didn't get saved so that he makes us just a bunch of workers. Remember A.W. Tozer, years ago, when he wrote a little booklet called Worship is the Jewel of the Church. And he said that, unfortunately, in the church, we often get somebody converted, and we immediately convert them into a worker for God. When, in fact, initially, we we need to help that person become a lover of God and a worshiper and find their identity in their their spirit of sonship and, and daughtership, adoption, of who we are in Christ. And that's, that's just who, and out of that identity will flow the privilege of ministry. So we're, we're not just a bunch of workers, like work bees, working for the queen bee. It's our heavenly father and our sons and daughters of the most high and uh, lovers. We're a bride being prepared and fashioned for when Jesus returns, the bridegroom, and to be married to him and the consummation of the kingdom. Like, this is romantic. This is fun. This is, there's a playful, childlike side to it. It's not just work, 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 work. And yet there is work to be done, but it's out of a place of rest. Anybody heard of Heidi Baker from Mozambique? Yeah, she just type A personality. She's a driven personality. Work, work, work for the Lord. And she had been like that all her life since she came to Christ at age 16 as a missionary. Her and her husband were in Mozambique, serving the Lord, working as hard as they could. They were burned out and tired. They started three little churches in an orphanage. And in that burned out state, they limped their way to Toronto, to the revival in Toronto. And she was touched by the Spirit of God, healed physically the first meeting she was at. I think she had tuberculosis or double pneumonia or something. And uh, so she got out of hospital and found her way, got her way to Toronto. The Lord healed her physically and then for seven days just powerfully touched her. This is a little on the dramatic side, but she couldn't walk for seven days. They had to put her in a wheelchair, and she was just so uh, undone by the presence of the Lord for seven days. Couldn't speak, and, uh, and the Lord was just recharging her on the inside and just rewiring her so that she would now serve the Lord out of a place of rest, not striving out of performance and drivenness. So that's important when we talk about um, equipping the saints for work of ministry. It's out of grace. It's out of rest that we're called to this. But we are called to be ministers, not just the person. In fact, you know, you even look at all the little labels that push the the wrong, what I call stinking thinking. Um, Even having reverend. Well, who's reverend other than Jesus? Yes, if we're going to say reverend, let's call each other reverend because we're all saints. But, um, But this clergy laity distinction has to continue to be jackhammered and, and busted and dismantled because it's so counterproductive to the expansion of the kingdom of God and Jesus building his church. I see a few heads nodding. 
And uh, that's not lowering the usefulness of the pastor and the value of the pastor. We need pastors. <laughs> He's the ultimate good shepherd, but he has under shepherds to care for and to, uh, and to help raise up other pastors to care for. But we are all ministers. We just have to find out what is our ministry. Do you actually believe yourself to be a minister of Christ? Yes? Turn to somebody and say, I am a minister of Jesus. And, and mean it. Go ahead. Because it, it's important actually to confess it, to speak it with your mouth. It somehow helps to start making the shift in your heart and head. I am a minister of Jesus. And maybe you can respond back to them and say, yes, you are. <laughs> Many of us, our ministry will be out in the marketplace. We need marketplace ministers. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. I'm going to have to skip a few things here just to, because of time. So here we have the people of God, the saints, who are ministers of God. We need elders, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, apostles, and God intricately fueling the whole thing. I deliberately put this upside down because we tend to think in hierarchy thinking, don't we? Corporate models of pyramids. But really, the five-fold leadership equipping ministries are to lift up the people of God. We're to come underneath them and lift them up so they can come into their full potential. So it's not like, because some senior pastors hear, oh, there's apostles now. Well, I got to be the top dog, so I guess I'm, a, I'm an apostle because I got to be at the top of the food chain here. It's not a food chain, it's not a hierarchy. Yes, can I hear an amen? amen. Yeah. I like to actually put it sideways because we're going somewhere, we're into a move of God, and the Lord's leading us. Yes, ap- apostles and prophets often give direction and lead the charge, but we're moving and, and moving forward, going somewhere. I love this painting uh, an artist in Alaska came up with of the five-fold ministry being like five wild horses and that eagle flying over is the Holy Spirit. And uh, so it's not even a hierarchy within the five-fold ministry. It's teamwork. And there's an apostolic reformation taking place, has been for a decade or two, and it's being called the New Apostolic Reformation. There's Bill Johnson on the right, Mike Bickle, Francis Chan. On the left is Heidi Baker, who I mentioned. A few other leaders involved in this movement. There's a number of others. Some of them are prophetic leaders. Some are apostolic leaders. So, we want the AT, the apostolic five-fold ministry team, to return, for the Lord to restore it to its fullness, and then we all win. How many want a win-win situation? Jesus wants it, and that's where he's taking us. Um, Time's up, so I'm not actually going to go through uh, the five offices. I'm going to do that tonight. I'm going to skip some of that. But as the five-fold ministry team gets operative more maturely and more freely, we are going to have a people, the people of God, The church of Jesus Christ is going to become apostolic, which is missional, by the way, and prophetic, hearing God's voice. The church will become evangelistic, as well as pastoral, as well as a teaching community. Uh, We need all five aspects of Jesus to to, uh, flow down into the body of Christ. Does that mean everyone will, will be one of these five? Well, no. It said Christ gave some in the office of apostle, some in the office of prophetic. But the whole body of Christ will function in your ministry. Some of you will have a prophetic dimension to it, some evangelistic, some more pastoral, some more teaching. And you may have a blend of several of them. Think of the rainbow. You don't have all distinct colors in a rainbow. They blend into each other. So you don't even have just the five-fold. As, oh, okay, you're an apostle. You're a prophet. You may have an apostolic teacher, a teaching ap- Apostle, you may have a prophetic evangelist. There's a blend that goes on. So, so we want, we like to dissect things and have them nice and neat and separate when they really 
it can start to blend. But ultimately, we're called to teamwork. Makes the dream work. <laughs> so we want to step into our supernatural destiny, don't we? Yes? yes? You have a destiny yet to fulfill. And we need to get ready for revival when God comes down. And we believe that is just around the corner. And with that, there'll be we are believing and preparing for a great harvest of many coming into the kingdom and into the church of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'll save the rest for tonight. Um, Barry, if we could go to... Have I got f five more minutes? Or should I wrap it up? Okay. Go to the, uh, the video on the autistic boy. Grace Athena High School in Rochester, New York, has a new, most unlikely hero, a special ed student by the name of Jason McElwain. Let's keep it going. Jason is the basketball team manager. For the past couple years, he's been assisting coach Jim Johnson, helping with whatever the team needs. Get him motivated and uh, hand out water and just be enthusiastic. Enthusiastic, to say the least. Despite being born with autism, Jason's father says his son has never had a problem expressing himself at basketball games. You know, I was always concerned that he might get a technical when they lose a game because he, you know, start yelling or whatever. Let's have a hard practice tomorrow, all hour and a half, and let's get ready for Arcadia. Okay. Let's go. One, two, three, two. Because he has been so devoted to the team, for the last game of the season, Coach Johnson decided to let Jason actually suit up. Not to play necessarily, just to let him feel what it's like to wear a jersey. At least that was the plan. But with four minutes to go in last week's game, Coach Johnson stood up and pointed to number 52, Jason McElwain. After years of fetching water and toweling off other people's sweat, Jason was actually in a game. His first shot was a 20-footer from the right baseline. Was it close? Did you almost I make missed. it? I just airballed it. <laughs> I'm like, just, dear God, please, let's just get him a basket. His second shot missed, too, but the third was a charm. A three-point no-doubter. And Jason wasn't done yet. Not by a long shot. If I wasn't there to witness it, I wouldn't have believed it, you know. He caught fire. I just caught fire. I was hot as a pistol. Jason ended up shooting six three-pointers one right after the other. He had 20 points total, and each time a shot went in, his teammates and the crowd went a little crazier. His last basket, right at the buzzer, created total mayhem. Because he is autistic, Jason says he's used to feeling different, but never this different, never this wonderful. Steve Hartman, CBS News, Rochester, New York. We can maybe identify with Jason. Uh, we all have our little handicaps of some kind and can feel like, how could God ever use me? You know, I've got this weakness or this insecurity or whatever. <clears throat> But when he dressed up in the uniform and, uh, and then the coach who loved him and saw how he served so faithfully the team, he was always encouraging the, the team. He was there serving them with water, with towels for several years, I think. Never got to play. But that was okay with him because he found his little niche to serve. But then he actually got to play as well. Now, to add to the success of this, I don't know if you noticed, but in the stands there had been a rumor that Jason might play in that game. And so a lot of the fans actually had posters, say, go, Jason, or, uh, or had a picture of his, of his face, you know, and, 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 and cheered him on. And that's what we're called to be in the body of Christ. We're on the same team. We need coaches. In our case, five different flavors of coaches uh, to cheer, and then we need each other to cheer and believe in what God has called each one of us to do. And uh, so I just love that. Jason went on, actually, President Bush came and, uh, and met him. And uh, I think even a, a documentary was being made of, 
out of this. And uh, we love success stories. We're the underdog. And in many ways, the church has been the underdog for a long time. And many people have written the church off as irrelevant, and it's just, you know, uh, the BBC years ago said, uh, the BBC interviewed a, a, a Christian church leader in, in Britain, and in that interview said, uh, the BBC reporter said, uh, we believe that we will actually be at the graveside, you know, of the church when it's buried. And uh, the, leader, the church leader said, no, no, we'll be at the graveside of the BBC when it becomes extinct. Because Jesus said he's building his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. We win. I, you've read the, re- the end of the story. But we want to win big, like Jason. Yes? Amen. So why don't you stand with me, and I'm just going to uh, pray a prayer over you, and then we're going to, I don't know if you do uh, another song or what you do, or... Um,